Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're all very welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, this morning's webinar will discuss the topic of uh, farm scale biogas. Let's share my slides. So this morning's topic is the potential for small scale AD on Irish farms. And um, we're delighted to welcome you to the ninth webinar in our uh, webinar series. Um, and uh, bring this one to you this morning. Sorry, no, just one second. Okay, and just before we begin, um, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce you to the Irish Bioenergy Association. And for some reason, my slides aren't sharing. There you go. We are seeing them, Sean. Okay. Thanks, Teresa. Okay, here we are. Okay, uh, so before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce you to the Bio Irish Bioenergy Association for any of you that um, hasn't joined us before. And I do apologize to the people and attendees this morning that have um, have joined the webinar on, on, the, on previous occasions because you'll see this slide many times at this stage, but we are the representative organization for the bioenergy sector in Ireland. We cover the sectors of biomass, biogas, biofuels, energy crops, and wood fuels. Uh, we have a broad and, and growing membership and we have a wide variety of activities which are all listed there, including a number of uh, projects which we're rolling out. And if you would like to become a member, we're, op we're a membership organization. We're open to, open to new members joining at all times across all the sectors uh, who have an interest in, this in, this, in the bioenergy sector or industry. Um, and you can access our website at www.erbia.org. And that, um, Will provide all the information to you about the association. Uh, this morning's agenda, um, we have, um, I will give a brief introduction myself um, and then it will be followed by a presentation from our technical executive Noel Gavigan. I will uh, come in then towards the end of Noel's presentation with a few slides on progress to date in the on the European Biogas, European Innovation Partnership Small Biogas Demonstration Project. And then uh, we will have a discussion with Tim Clark, who is a biogas consultant and is working with us on the project. And then we will have a, a panel discussion with Tim, Noel, myself, and we'll take your questions at that stage. Uh, your questions can be posted through the Q&A tab, which is available at the bottom of the screen. And we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible that you have. Just to uh, state the date, uh, our next webinar will take place on the 4th of November. And um, it's a Wednesday, Wednesday fortnight. Um, two weeks time, two weeks from here, uh, 9.30 to 10.30, um, and we haven't confirmed the topic as of yet, and we will do so in the coming days. So just to briefly introduce this morning's topic, uh, last week we discussed um, the medium to large scale potential for an Irish biogas industry, or the potential for a medium to large scale industry. This morning we're focusing very much on the farm scale and the small scale. Um, because it has um, a lot of potential as well. Um, there are an abundance of waste and residues available as feedstock on farms. Um, there are many benefits to of an Irish biogas industry, and this is a mainstream industry across Europe. And Noel will very clearly articulate um, examples of small scale uh, biogas on farms across Europe. And the energy generated can be used in the heat, electricity, and transport sectors. And but for the medium to large scale, and it's just a recap on last week, there is a gap between the price of fossil gas on the grid and the production of cost of biogas. So that will be, have to be supported in terms of a medium to large scale model. And we will demonstrate um, that for a small scale farm plant, um, it's more capital support we feel that would be required. This industry can develop and grow economic, air, economic development in rural areas. And it is a new industry for Ireland because it's not mainstream and there are only a, a small number of plants dotted across the country. Just to briefly recap again for anyone that didn't attend last week and um, we, where we make a distinction between the difference in small scale and medium to large scale. 
I think it's quite important to show this slide because there is a lot of confusion out there amongst the farming community um, and within various circles um, about the differences in scale and also the differences in location, ro the farmer's role, the feedstock supply, energy demand and support required. So I'll briefly go through this slide. Um, so in terms of location of a farm scale plant, that would be on, an exist on a farm and would complement an existing farm enterprise. And as I said, it is the focus of our EIP project. For a medium to large scale plant, its location would be more of a cooperative style plant, centrally located. So it would mean that it's located uh, close to the gas grid and supplied by many farmers. And that leads me on to the role of the farmer at both scales, which is distinctly different. Uh, at, a, at a small farm scale or small scale, we would say that the farmer's role is to supply the feedstock and operate the plant. Obviously, they might take in external expertise to assist them with that, but the, the, that would be their, their responsibility. At a medium to large scale, the farmer's role would be to provide the feedstock to the plant operated by a, a, a private enterprise or a cooperative or another um, business. In terms of feedstock supply, um, Feedstock would be available on the farm for the small scale. There would be no import requirement because when you have an import requirement, you increase the requirements around animal byproducts regulations and other requirements. And then at a medium to large scale, um, the material feedstock would be sourced from a variety of farmers and suppliers within the catchment area of the plant. So that could be farmers, it could be um, food waste, it could be uh, agri-industrial residues from uh, local cooperatives or meat processing plants. So it could be, it'd be a wide variety of sources from many different farmers. In terms of energy demand, um, we the, at a small farm scale, um, the energy demand would be satisfied, uh, would be, it would be satisfying a non-farm energy demand or a energy demand in the vicinity. Whereas in a medium to large scale model, it would be exporting to a transmission network. That could be the gas grid, it could be the electricity grid. So it, it could be, um, either of those. And then in terms of the supports which are required to make this viable at both scales, our view within the association and our members is that capital support is required to offset, uh, to, to incentivize or to encourage um, deployment of small scale AD, uh, whereas uh, a biogas support is required um, at a medium to large scale per unit of output. So that's a feed-in tariff or a support scheme, whereas it's distinctly different from the support levels required for the initial capital investment at a farm scale to, and that the return investment would be from offsetting an, an existing fossil fuel bill on the farm. So I hope I've explained to you through that slide um, the main differences, which I think sets the scene for our presentation this morning. Um, so our next slide, uh, our next, I will now hand over to my colleague Noel Gavigan. Um, Noel will present to you um, some further details about uh, this scale, farm scale plants and size and um, various aspects. And uh, I will come back in then with an update on the EIP project specifically uh, towards the end of Noel's presentation. So I'll stop sharing Noel and if you can uh, share your screen and hopefully it'll, it'll work for us. Okay, sure. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, I'll now, just introduce Noel as the technical executive at the Irish Bioenergy Association, and Noel is the project manager for the uh, um, EIP small scale biogas demonstration project. So, Noel, um, over to you. No, thanks, Sean. Can you see that, look, is that coming up okay? Yeah, you might have to turn off your video. Just go to presentation mode, Noel. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, you might have to turn off your video because of the the coverage. Okay. Yeah, there, was, there were some coverage issues here this morning. Now, uh, first of all, thanks very much for the introduction there, Sean. So what I'll do is just introduce this uh, program they're doing, the EAP uh, Small Biogas Demonstration Project. Um, Sean is going to give you a bit more details of the project itself, but exactly what we're trying to do on a technical basis, I'll go through that with you. Um, essentially, the project, Sean will give you these details later on, but it's, it's a, the idea is to demonstrate on-farm biogas as opposed to industrial scale funded by the Department of Agriculture, it's ourselves, the Irish Bioenergy Association, Chagas, Leash Partnership and Tipperary Cheese are, are the partners within the project itself. Now, the, in terms of the benefits of biogas on farm, the reason we originally started to look at this uh, was really looking at the production of renewable energy and how it could be done on, on site. But 
the original uh, move for anaerobic digestion on farms going back to the 1980s and even late 1970s was initiated by organic farmers looking to recycle nutrients. The nutrients were extremely valuable and what's uh, obviously where you're not importing nutrients. So, and it, it was seen as a, a very good way of recycling those through the system. But what's interesting is now, as we have embarked on this project, those benefits are really starting to come to the fore. So it's not only the production of renewable energy, such as be it heat, electricity, or possibly vehicle fuel. The recycling of nutrients has a number of benefits. Number one, it's the, there was a, a very good evidence that came out from the research um, paper by the Department of Agriculture last year, late last year, showing that digest it, once you put stuff through a digester, your slur slurry in your farm waste through a digester, the nutrients are far more available to the plant and far less likely to be leached into water courses. So they've done a lot of trial work out on farm to determine whether there was a benefit or not. And the benefit was, was quite strong in terms of reducing our leaching of nutrients um, to water courses. So obviously that is a major impact in our impact on, on water quality. And that is something that's really come to the fore if you look at the EPA results recently for, for um, water courses. They are under pressure. So this is, is something very positive in that sense that it, it's a tool, we have in the toolbox that we can use to address that. And obviously if the nutrients are not going into the water courses, they're staying on farm. And it's, this is well evidenced and, and experienced by farmers using Digestate that it does reduce fertilizer costs. It does have a much greater kick in terms of particular nitrogen. And they do notice a considerable benefits from using Digestate as opposed to slurry or other farm wastes. And then finally, the last one is then is reduction of ammonia emissions. It's something that, to be honest with you, we haven't seen much of in the, up until about six to eight months ago. But suddenly ammonia is really starting to come to the fore in terms of the damage it can do to some of the natural sites. And we're well aware this is becoming more and more of a prominent issue. So we have to say that the reduction of ammonia emissions, uh, which you will get from um, digesting material and, and properly storing it, is of major benefit. So uh, it's something that we're very keen to um, explore more in this project, but also it's something that adds benefit from an environmental context uh, for using um, the biogas on farm. Now, I'm very briefly going to do a quick uh, synopsis of, we're all familiar with the industrial scale or you're possibly familiar with the industrial scale. We've done a seminar on it last week. If you want to look at that webinar, um, it, it's online there and it's on our website and you can look through it. But the larger industrial plants typically four to five, 10, 20 million euros, depending on what size you're building, and using um, a huge variety of, of waste feedstocks. And they're not farm-based, they are using, they can use farm material and do use farm material, but they need a huge volume and it's an industrial scale. They are very good at producing large amounts of power for the grid or heat for, you know, for industrial use or gas potentially for the, for the gas grid, but it, it, it's a different scale. Um, there's a huge level of complexity. I'm not going to go into that, but that's some of the, if you're a project manager, there are some of the topics you will be handling. As you can see, there's a lot in it. Um, but then on the other end of the scale, there is what we see in the developing world, and there are literally millions of these in Southeast Asia. And they are, as you can see, very much a, a septic tank type situation, and they are producing gas off do those. You can see on the picture on, on the lower left-hand side, this is actually a piece of garden hose bringing gas into the domestic home where they're using the gas for heating, or sorry, for, for cooking. And they also use it for lighting. Um, very simple systems. Uh, this dome type is one type you see uh, probably in China, from what I understand. And then this is sometimes referred to as the Indian model where you have a floating top. Uh, you'll see a concrete block on top to increase gas pressure. Very, very basic stuff. But what it does show is that biogas is very simple to produce it doesn't need the high level complexity that we see in industrial sites, depending on what you're actually trying to do. So where we are on an Irish farm level, we're somewhere in between those two scales. So this is an example we came across um, several years ago. It was actually um, a number of people from Westmead had gone over and visited Austria, looking at forestry actually, and they were brought to this site as a, as a by the way. And it turned out to be one that was returned to to get a more comprehensive study done. And it was through the Bioregions project. But it was a very interesting site. Um, it's a small cheese farm uh, in Austria. It's near the German border. 
they have here you can see a, a scraper system um, with, with cubicles for cows. They're all stored in here. I think it was a 50 cow herd rather than 30 is indicated on, on the screen. The, all the slurry is scraped into this digester here, which is a rectangular tank. There's a spine wall in the middle and an agitator, which, uh, which is based up here, which, caught, which uh, induces circulation within the tank. They have a compressor here for, the, for compressing the gas, so a small amount for it to go through to a boiler. They have a, a, this is the parlour here, the milking parlour. They have a cheese plant. And um, what you're looking at in this picture is the end, um, just where, where the, the cows are inside here. This is the slurry tank you can see notified here, is here in the picture. So you're at one end of the building. And uh, the house is this end. This is an area of, of the Alps where you get two to three metres of snow and they literally can be cocooned in for a period of time. So what they actually, the traditional way of dealing with that is everything is under one roof. You have the cows, you have your cheese plant, you have your dairy, and you have the domestic home, all literally under that one roof. And um, so it's a very interesting in that sense. But what, uh, what they do is they, all of the whey coming off the cheese plant, all of the slurry coming off the cows goes into the digester. And they are able to produce all of the heating needs they need to produce cheese and to heat the house from that digester. The overall capital cost of that plant, as you can see here, was 35,000. They are gaining about 6,500 euros a year in gas value. That's basically replacing fuel they were buying in. So the payback there is seven years. So it's a very simple system. You take your slurry, you take your whey, you put it into your digester, you get your biogas off that. It goes into a compressor and a 50 kilowatt boiler, and you have all the heat you need for your cheese plant and your home. So it was a, a, an extremely interesting example, and it's so, sort of in, in line to scale we're looking at here for Irish farms, obviously, we're a little bit more than the 30 or 50 cow herds uh, for, for most. Um, just in terms of the history of biogas in Ireland, this was one of the first plants built in the country. This picture here on the left was taken in, in 1992 when it was built, um, and I took this picture four years ago when I visited the site. So you can see uh, there's a couple of additions in tanks and um, this is, I think it's since been, might have been decommissioned, but as you can see, the, the structure itself and the plant had operated for almost, you know, getting close on 25, 30 years. And um, again, it was about a 35,000 investment and uh, it was used for home heating and predominantly for, for producing nutrients for uh, an organic farm. So another example is in Ballytobin, Kilkenny, again, built in 1995, still operational. That's the digester here. Uh, there was also a, a portion of a horizontal feed digester on the inside, but uh, again, it, it heats a whole residential area there. There's a residential system down there for, for, which is all he heated by district heating. It takes in slurry from neighbouring farms and some other organic wastes. So a very good example and uh, operational, as you can see, for, for quite a period of time. There are plenty of other examples around Europe. This is another one we came, came across in Germany, larger in scale investment of about a half a million. It was, a, again, a 75 kilowatt boiler uh, attached to that. The installed capacity was 75 for the whole entire plant, but they had a payback there of six years. And then this example then, which was recently built in the UK, it's on a farm with 280 dairy cows, again, 75 kilowatt, which are, they're housed all year round. And it uses the slurry and also farmyard manure. Now, it's, what's interesting on this one is this tank here is used for putting in your, your, your dung, your farmyard manure. And it's literally tractor and loader loaded in here, mixed with slurry and pumped into the, the rest of it. So, again, it's an Irish company that done, done that. So, very interesting sim system, relatively simple. And, um, you know, it's something that, that, that's operational and a, a new plant. Within this project, what we're looking at doing is we are trying to determine what fits best onto an Irish farm. And obviously there's, a, uh, there's as many uh, designs of Irish farms as there's practically farms itself. We have every sort of scale. So we're looking at, at particular things at the start. We want to get a couple of examples. That would be something we can repeat across a much larger number. We are looking at using slurry. The possibility of using surplus grass Essentially, we're looking at meeting on-site energy demand, uh, so that would be heating and electricity, or close by uh, heating um, or electricity. Now, recently we came across an example of somebody where there was a nursing home, um, you know, within a couple of hundred yards away. So that was an, a very good example of something we could do within the course of this project, and it's something we will look at uh, as time goes on. 
So those sort of ideas, if you have high demand for heat and sight, you see that with, with poultry and pig farms where there's a high demand for energy. And um, not as much for, for dairy farmers, but there is some. And then obviously we want to look at recycling the nutrients. We have one proposal uh, through the project we're looking at a proposed uh, dairy and cheese farm. So the dairy farm were to produce cheese on site. Uh, they have an annual heating bill of about 80,000 spent on heating oil. Using the, the on-site slurry, the whey and some surplus grass, we should be able to replace all of that. Now they do have a, an electric bill of 42,000. What was interesting when we started crunching numbers and this was, it didn't make economic sense to replace the electricity. A uh, cost of um, producing electricity from biogas by the time you pay for a generator or get the proper switch gear for the grid and all that has a lot to capital cost. But when you're replacing kerosene, kerosene is a very expensive, a relatively expensive form of heating. And it's worth noting that the carbon tax, we know it's gone to 33 euros a ton now. When that gets as far as 100 euros a ton, which is the projection by 2030, that will add 28 cent onto every litre of kerosene. So there is a huge, um, you know, that's a huge price to start looking at in, as, as we look into the future in terms of the high cost of using fossil fuels. And that is the whole purpose of a carbon tax, that it starts us looking at, at alternatives purely because they're, it's cost prohibitive to use fossil fuels. So that 28, litre, euro, 28 cent on a litre of kerosene is significant. And it is something that is going to start people really considering what they're doing. Um, so within the project, what we're looking for is a, a good dairy farm demo, pig farm, uh, we're looking at beef, poultry and horticulture. Now, within the scope of the project, we have capital funding for three, so we won't be able to do all of these, but we are trying to identify good demonstration sites that we can use. Um, predominantly, you know, the, the, the holy grail in all this would be to get something that will work on 150 cow herd or 100 cow herd with, with very little uh, additional to it because obviously if you if we can get a model that fits onto that farm and is economically viable on that farm then there are several thousand such farms around the country that could benefit from this technology so the focus of this project is purely on producing models that will work on Irish farms that we can uh, both demonstrate on, on a singular capacity but predominantly we want to expand that out and ha have a, something that would, is within the, the remit of agri Irish agriculture to look at how we're going to reduce the impact on, on water, how we're going to reduce our carbon emissions. And if the biogas does fit into that quite well, if we can get the model correct. So we're really looking at something that can be rolled out to a vast number of farms. And ultimately through this, we're trying to get the design on that. So that's, I suppose, the basis of, of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I'm just going to the, we have one piece for, for recommended reading as well, which I'll just show you on that. And that this is the, the RAIS report. It's a review of anaerobic digestion plants in the UK. Now that report in itself goes through, first of all, it describes biogas and the, the process quite well. You'll find it online quite easily. But what's very interesting in it is it interviews a large number of farmers that have biogas plants. And some of those plants are from the, the 1980s and one or two of them are from the 70s that started using biogas on farm in the late 1970s. And it's very interesting to see the practical um, experience of those farms in, in what has worked, what has not worked. And it's very, very interesting to read that and you, you learn a lot from it in terms of how biogas can fit on, onto farm. You know, there's some very good practical examples in terms of when you're using slurry, it tends to digest very, very easily. It needs very little intervention and quite re it'll quite readily digest once you keep the heat on it. Uh, so with very little intervention, it, you won't need to be adding in base um, enzymes around that you would see with food waste. So it, it, it's quite interesting in terms of, of, of the practicalities. You know, as one farm you know, on it describes, they walk by the digester every day. If the lights are all still green, to keep going because it's, 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 it's all the only thing that will go wrong with it is maybe a pump or something like that. So these things are, when you get a good model going and a robust model, there's something that, that, that stand the test of time uh, once they're properly designed and once they fit into the system correctly. So that is what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, we've had uh, Sean go through all the expressions of interest. I might leave, a, leave it over Sean at this point in time, but the, um, it's a, this, is, this is from a technical point of view, that's what we're, we're looking at achieving on, through the project. 
So, um, Sean, I might pass back to you at that. Okay, that's great, Noel, and thanks very much. Um, and if anyone has difficulty in accessing or sourcing that um, recommended reading, um, if you want to get in touch with us, um, we can um, look and see, can we um, provide it to you? Um, so I'm just going to reshare my slides. Um, so, um, Okay, so as Noel has said, um, this project that we're involved in is called the Small Biogas Demonstration Program, SBDP for short. It's an EIP project, so some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware of what EIP is, European Innovation Partnership. It's a Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine funded program through the Rural Development Program, the CAP Rural Development Program. So um, we're one of um, 23, uh, I understand, EIP projects across the country and the EIP, EIP projects um, cover a wide variety of areas from biodiversity to uh, biorefining um, to um, biochar to a wide variety of topics and plenty of information is available on the Department of Agriculture website about all of the projects. So when we applied for this project, our aim was to see how we could deploy uh, innovative solutions in terms of on-farm small-scale biogas production. And I think it's very important that we determine what uh, small scale, because a lot of the time we're asked, well, what is it in terms of size? And it all probably depends on the size of the farm and the scale of the farm. Uh, but it could be anything from 20 kilowatt up to 200 kilowatt, depending on the size and scale of the farm in operation and, and enterprise. Beyond that, you go to a different model, you go to a a difference, it's, it's a larger investment, it's, uh, you probably might be exporting material, exporting the, 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 the gas, um, and it's a different, a different level. Uh, we are providing, as Noel said, um, capital contribution to three demonstration sites, um, and we will look, as a result in a de of developing the demonstration sites, we will provide or look into researching how to understand how the biogas plants deployed at each farm can improve the sustainability of the farm, but also imp improve the environmental footprint of the farm, reduce the emissions on the farm, and um, put a value on all of that uh, uh, reduction which could take place. So we will develop, uh, or we are through the project, developing the capacity of technology providers and delivering this scale. Uh, we've had engagements with a wide variety of technology providers, and others one or two on the call this morning. Um, we also want to demonstrate uh, how um, we can comply with the sustainability criteria in the context of the Renewable Energy Directive. But uh, a very important part of all of this is to raise awareness amongst the farming community of the increased challenge of climate change or climate action and emissions, but also how biogas can present a solution uh, to the challenges we face and how through a series of workshops and information events and demon, um, dissemination events, we will do that. Um, and we've already done some of that last year. And this work webinar is also feeding into that process and part of that. And finally, um, and we want to demonstrate the results of the project are widely deployable. We want to identify potential technologies that can be used with the objective that we can go back to the Department of Agriculture at the end of the project and say that the cost of developing a scale, farm scale plant on X, Y, and Z farms was X figure, and that uh, to try and see and also demonstrate what improvement that has meant in terms of the farm op operation and enterprise, and then put a put a value on that and be able to lobby for a more extensive or broader uh, capital support scheme for this size and scale of plant. Um, the total budget for the project is uh, just short of a million euros. Over five hundred thousand of that will be. Uh, distributed in the capital supports and the remainder is to cover consultancy fees to cover uh, costs associated with the rollout and, uh, and running of the project and the project will roll out or run has started on the 1st of January 2019 and is running until the end of December 2022. Uh, we didn't expect obviously in, like none of us expected um, a pandemic to hit us in that intervening period so we have to just see we are probably slightly behind where we would like to be at this stage because of our ability to go out and meet farmers and meet technology providers and even technology providers travel to Ireland if they're based outside the country to, to meet us. Um, it has put a lot of restrictions on, um, but it means that we move, we've moved to online. 
but there is only so much you can do online as well. So we hope that the COVID-19 won't dramatically impact on our program, but we'll have to monitor that as we progress and uh, continue to report back on that to the department. So just briefly summarize, I have three or four slides here, uh, just to summarize where we're at in terms of progress, because I know you would be interested in it. Um, so the focus in 2019 was to set up the project, to raise the awareness and to hold information meetings and complete a farmer expression of interest process. And we completed all of those uh, elements in 2019. Um, in 2019, the farmer information meetings were held in late, late in the year. They were advertised in the Farmer's Journal and various and other Agriland, Farming Independent, Farming Examiner, all the other agri-media. And um, seven meetings were held. We thank Chagas for, their, for hosting us at some, in some locations, and then we had them in hotels and others. But all in all, 461 farmers attended the seven workshops, which was remarkable considering that we don't have an industry here, but it did signify the level of interest which exists amongst the farming community uh, for this, um, for biogas and anaerobic digestion. Um, we had a wide variety of presenters at each of those workshops. Some of you on the call this morning may have attended some of those workshops. So Noel presented uh, on the technical information and as project manager for this project. And we had speakers from Chagas, from NUI Galway, with biogas technology providers, Stains Law, with accountants, with a wide variety of speakers on various aspects associated with the, um, with the project and, and the biogas area. So we then opened an expression of interest process uh, that closed on the 1st of November and 259 farmers applied through the expression of interest process. Um, so that was a, a huge number of farmers to put their details forward through the online form, which was quite comprehensive and it would have taken at least 15, 20, maybe half an hour to complete. So it did show the level of interest that was there and is there amongst the farming community for this uh, scale and size of, of uh, biogas uh, plant. So um, <clears throat> the 259 farmers applied. We did expect, and um, we, we, I don't know, we were quite surprised. We received over 10 times the amount of expressive interest that we had expected. We only expected 25 to 30 in that range. Um, so this has presented a bit of an administrative challenge for the project in that we had to review, sit down, review 259 applications, go through them, um, evaluate them, um, categorize them and we're in the process now of responding to them uh, responding to each farmer because we we feel as if we have a duty through the project when farmers went to the trouble of putting together an expression of interest it will give them individual feedback about their own individual application and where what what the feedback on that application is so uh, for any of the farmers and it, there's a couple of farmers on the call this morning that i know have applied uh, you'll just have to bear with us uh, we will get back to you in the coming weeks uh, with your feedback and we will also um, be, be moving on then to the next stage. So um, the farmer expression of expressions have been assessed on three criteria, uh, the availability of feedstock on the farm, the energy demand on the farm or in the vicinity. And we also had a qu couple of questions here about the farmer's knowledge of the biogas sector and the biogas industry and, and biogas in general. And the knowledge that or the information that came back through the expression of interest vary quite significantly in terms of the farmer's knowledge. Some farmers had no knowledge and other farmers had quite significant knowledge and had actually traveled to European countries looking at plants and all um, like that as well. So the knowledge, it is important that farmers would have some level of knowledge. It's not a key criteria. I think the first two are the key criteria is feedstock available on the farm. That could be slurry. It could be whey. It could be um, uh, all sorts of animal uh, waste materials are indeed other um, other uh, materials also. Um, so <clears throat> we have currently categorized the farmers into three categories, category one, two, and three. Um, so we've categorized category one would be that we don't believe that the farm is viable at present for the development of a farm scale AD plant. And that would be as a result of not having sufficient amount of feedstock, not having sufficient amount of not having a feedstock or not having an energy demand and indeed having probably little knowledge in terms of the biogas area. Um, and over 100, around 130 of the farmers, unfortunately, have fallen into this category. Um, but it's not to say that they can't become viable if other, um, if feedstock does become available on the farm or if an energy demand does arise uh, in the future, potentially they might. Category two, 
um, is um, category two is farmers that are viable at present, not viable at present because they have either feedstock or an energy demand, but don't have both. And they would predominantly be some of our large scale dairy farmers and beef finishers who have plenty of slurry in terms of the beef finishing um, operations, but have no energy demand whatsoever. And then uh, on the dairy side, uh, they're obviously utilizing grass to the maximum in terms of their um, cows. And so they don't have a whole lot of feedstock, but they have an energy demand, but that energy demand is variable and it's um, it's only at milking times and it's electricity. So we're trying to find solutions and working with technology providers to see what solutions can be found to um, to our on what feedstock can also be found to maybe, maybe make some of those 100 farmers viable in terms of the project. And then the category three farmers, um, they are farmers that have a viable project as we see it from the expression of interest. They have feedstock, they have an energy demand, uh, and in most cases, they have some level of, in, of knowledge of biogas. But as I said, that wasn't a, a key consideration because as part of the project, we'll be taking farmers through a step-by-step -step process anyways. So we can increase that knowledge and awareness through the project. So we are in the process, as I said, in writing back uh, with feedback to, to all the individual farmers. We will. We have also engaged quite significantly with um, a quite comprehensive list of technology, potential technology providers. So we have developed our list of technology providers. If there is a technology provider on the call that you that hasn't engaged with us, feel free to get in touch with us after. Um, and. Noel mentioned that one of the there is a predetermined site as part of the project, and that is the um, Hayes's farm. And um, the uh, tender or the planning process is about to be embarked upon for that project. And Tim Clark, who's on our call this morning, has completed a design for that plant and that project. And we're hoping that that design could be used as a benchmark design for future plans. So we spent the last number of months. To, working through that design, working through the various elements of it, and we're hoping that that um, design can be can be utilized um, potentially on other farms as well. And Tim will be working with us with the other farmers also. So just to summarize and to complete this, the last slide, um, so the project has been broken into different stages. So we have stage one is completed, stage two is pretty much completed um, um, in terms of shortlisting. Uh, the next stage is we're going to be talking to the farmers in category three and also engaging with the farmers in category two to see what we can do to make them potentially viable for future schemes. We don't envisage the category two farmers will receive any support through the this pro this this project because we have only a limited amount of support. So we will all towards the end of this year we'll be asking working with the farmers over the next couple of weeks to develop detailed plans for each farm and we will be asking those asking for farmers to submit those plans to us to be ranked by an independent board, independent of all myself and all and the other project, um, people working on this project. And that then will determine who receives the capital awards, capital grants, uh, and the, then we will progress with those projects with planning um, in January um, and hopefully be in a position to start construction of, of the plans towards the end of 2021 with the full 2022 then to commission and to demonstrate the project uh, sites. So um, that's the uh, that's the, the concluding slide. So um, I'll, uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen at this stage and um, I might just ask Tim and Noel to switch on your cameras and um, unmute yourselves and um, we will um, then uh, engage in a, some discussion. And just to remind you that there is a Q and A tab um, at the bottom of the screen and some questions have already come in and we would ask you to continue to feed your questions through the Q and A tab and um, we will uh, endeavor to answer as many of them as possible. So Tim, um, you're welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, uh, can you hear us okay? I can, can you hear yes, me sure? Thank, we can indeed, Tim, we can indeed. So Tim, maybe just by way of introduction, um, I know you have many years experience working in the biogas industry across many, uh, across Ireland, the UK, European countries, and indeed worldwide. So can you just give us a quick uh, summary of your own career to date and your own involvement in terms of the biogas industry um, and uh, what, what kind of 
projects you have worked on, and then we'll go into to the specifics more around the small farm scale, which were, is our topic this morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, I joined, I became interested in biogas in the 1980s, early, well, yeah, 1980 to be precise, um, when uh, I perceived that there, was, uh, there were various crises, uh, the energy crisis at the time, and, um, and I was also interested in, in just the general trend of environmental problems that I could see happening at the time, having trained in ecology and, uh, and as an engineer. So um, I went traveling around the world at that point to uh, India, uh, looked at their biogas program there, um, and then I went on to New Zealand, um, where, I, where I, in fact I did my master's in New Zealand. Um, and I visited various plants which were extremely informative, and I'll tell you about those, um, which were being operated down in the south of New Zealand. Um, in fact, what we can, uh, we can, I can jump to that straight away because I can, could share some slides later. In that, uh, in because of the energy problems in New Zealand at the time, um, they embarked on a natural gas program for for the North Island, um, and the South Island had no natural gas, and the farmers felt left out. So they decided to. So the Ministry of Agriculture put in a demonstration, small demonstration biogas plant in um, at their research station in Invermay um, near Dunedin. And I went to visit that and spent uh, several days there. And they basically produced a, a, a design which became a sort of self-build copycat design for about 20 farms um, with the objective of producing biogas from virtually anything that was on the on the farm, including waste uh, materials and uh, even waste crop materials, um, even the tops of thistles from, from fields and various things like this, whatever they could find, um, uh, with a view to producing um, biomethane for their vehicles. Um, this was facilitated to, some, to a great extent by the fact that the digesters, when you're producing biomethane, you need to keep the digester warm and electricity was very, very cheap in New Zealand um, because of hydro. So they were able to very cheaply heat their digesters. But I've got some uh, examples which I can share with, um, with Arabia um, of a number of farms which uh, I visited. And they were all basically self-built projects um, using the using the design that had been demonstrated at um, at uh, the Ministry of Agriculture plant at Inver Invermay, um, with a very simple cleaning uh, gas cleaning upgrading uh, facility, um, which I then copied subsequently, which I can tell you about. Um, so they had about twenty of these farms, and they were quite successful. Tim, have um, you got uh, photographs there or anything that you would like to share? Um, I do, I do, we, yes. We don't have a whole lot of time now, we've only 15 minutes, so, and we have a couple of questions to address, but just if yep. you, even by way of introduction, maybe just yep. uh, if you have uh, any... Quickly run through the introduction, yeah. And then, so, uh, as a, I then went back to the UK and I joined the UK's first really successful biogas company, Farm Gas, um, as an as a R&D development uh, engineer, and we started developing a lot of... Uh, new things for biogas industry which was not which were not available at the time of course and um, so um, we built probably about 20 or 30 small digesters on farms um, and at the time the main access was uh, the main accent was on uh, environmental improvement um, and there were capital grants available at the time um, and so there was a sort of a heyday in the in the in the mid 80s for for a number of farms, probably about 20 to 25, 30 farms putting in digesters uh, for for um, various, they were using the energy for basically home heating. There was no electricity program going on at the time. Uh, and also basically mainly for environmental improvements, stopping pollution. Some of them had been uh, put on notice that they had to reduce their uh, their pollution. And that was, uh, so that was really where I 
I learned my trade, if you like, uh, from, okay. right okay. from the very beginning. And just we speak, and you you understand from we've I've outlined in an earlier slide the difference in the scale. So we're obviously dealing with the farm scale uh, at today. Um, can you just give us your own view, having the experience of seeing the um, New Zealand and how they used AD there back when you were when you were there? Can you just maybe articulate your um, vision for the potential of small farm scale in Ireland. Um, it has a place. What is its place? And can you yeah. just give us your views on that? I mean, you know, essentially, as we all know, it's all about the money. Um, uh, from a practical point of view, in terms of every project has to be financially viable. Um, and the the payback for, for you know, for small plants, for any plant really, is is uh, energy. Um, so I see that the initial um, the initial uh, development here will be for those farms that do have a significant energy cost that they can substitute uh, for by by biogas. Um, so the um, the current project that we're engaged on. Um, is a good example of that because there's a very substantial energy uh, replacement value. Um, it's, uh, it's the frustrating thing for the biogas sector over in its existence has really been the, if you like, the, um, the financialization of all the very environmental um, benefits. So we can say reducing pollution, we can say, um, you know, for, um, especially reducing pollution, uh, but also sort of substituting for fertilizers um, what, to actually capitalize uh, and put a financial value on those things has been difficult. And I think this is where this program will be uh, very, very beneficial in terms of trying to focus, um, the, the focus some attention on the actual financial uh, benefits to, for, so farms can get some financial ben benefits from those um, the other aspects, the other benefits of which there are many for uh, for biogas. Um, and then the, then I think that uh, we'll be moving towards in time um, substitution for vehicle fuel as as a small scale local substitution for vehicle fuel. I think there's huge potential there. Um, and this might involve, uh, especially, I can see some places where maybe uh, what a farm would do a, do a deal with um, a local transport provider or lo local logistics, uh, some some um, company that has uh, regular demand for for vehicle fuel, and they can su supply the the the, the uh, biomethane for that project. Um, but whatever it is, it needs to be fairly regular. Um, source of, uh, you know, of of energy use because the main problem with biogas, which was always, uh, and this was the success of the electricity program, is that biogas is is produced all the time, twenty four seven. Um, storage is very expensive, um, and so you really need to have a continuous uh, and regular use for for the biogas that gives you a payback. So I see that being an exciting development in the future um, that we'll be moving towards. Okay, just before we go, Tim, to a couple of um, uh, questions that have come in. Um, have you, for any farmers we have on the call this morning or on the webinar this morning, have you any advice for them in terms of how they go about developing a plant and what preca precautions and cautions should they um, adopt in, in that process? Well, I think simplicity is the key. Um, I think that uh, being able to having a regular supply of feedstock um, is is important. A regular and fresh supply of feedstock, and this is obviously a problem for for the dairy industry that only has sort of uh, that house their cattle for for or their cows for uh, um, for only sort of three months of the year maybe, um, and then the problem is to obtain sufficient feedstock to keep the digester operating financially uh, in a financially viable way for, for the rest of the year. So, so those projects which will work, are basically those projects will basically 
will be a round peg into a round hole instead of a round peg into a square hole, if you see what I mean. Yeah. You know, okay. um, for instance, uh, you know, obtaining slurry very easily and freshly is a, is a, if you're a dairy farm, is a big start, to yeah. where, especially if you can adapt uh, sort of scraper systems and that kind of thing. Um, so some farms have, have, uh, would have very practical way of getting the slurry freshly from basically from the cow directly to the digester. And another, other farms would have a lot more difficulty. And I think that certainly for those farms that are looking forward to the future for development, they should take uh, a lot of heed on this in terms of their slurry management and how they, their slurry collection with a view to potentially putting it into a digester at some point in the future. Okay, um, we'll come back to you in a second, Tim, uh, just to, um, and maybe if you could just be, be gathering up your, if you had a couple of photographs that you want to share, and um, we'll just go through the questions before you share them. Uh, there's just a couple of questions in here, and Noel, I'll revert to you as well on the questions. There's one here about, is the viability also based on a new electricity sub, uh, subsidy scheme opening up, refit four? So I suppose the answer to that is that refit, we moved away from a refit model. I think refit three was the last uh, refit scheme from an electricity perspective, and it's now called RES, Renewable Electricity Support Scheme. So it's an auction-based system. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, it has it is technology neutral, uh, but there was some in the auction which has just been completed, and there was some um, dedicated package for solar. Uh, the costs associated with wind and solar are a lot less than bioenergy, biogas, biomass, CHP. And as a result, um, we would be asking for a dedicated window or, or package within res, future res auctions for bioenergy. Um, but um, so but we're, we're working and lobbying for that at the moment. We have no, um, nothing, no feedback on that uh, as of yet. So the viability really isn't based on an electricity support scheme because we're not focused on electricity as part of this. Electricity might be an option on some farms, but the cost associated with CHP is, is, is significant in terms of the project. And I know some farmers have kind of wondered about that, but in terms of small scale, uh, CHP is quite expensive. So we're looking at maybe more heat, but also CHP is an option for some. So, Noel, do you want to expand on that? Is, is there anything further yes, to add Look, uh, just as I said at the very last, there the, the support scheme for renewable heat is actually what's underpinning some of the models we're doing because they have a large heat demand on site. And again, it's easier to produce heat from biogas than it is electricity, or it's cheaper to do so. And where you are replacing an expensive fuel such as kerosene, um, it does make a huge difference. So having the SSRH to, to, to the support scheme for renewable heat to, to make up the shortfall. In terms of the uh, electricity support, there, if we are to look at that, uh, there, there is a need for a, a section of the, the renewable electricity support that is going to be earmarked just for biogas because it's, um, there's particular benefits from biogas going into the grid and from different bioenergy sources going into the grid and the fact that it's, it's dispatchable power. You can produce electricity uh, 24 hours a day whereas the intermittent sources such as wind and solar are cheaper to produce electricity, but obviously they have the reliability issues. So as we go forward and want a more balanced grid, um, having a support scheme for, for biogas is going to be more and more important for an electrical point of view. There's also uses then for, for up, upgrading the gas and using it on grid, or as Tim, uh, is very interesting, uh, this program where they're using it for vehicles, because vehicle fuel is one of the more expensive forms of energy and when we look at all of the energy uses that we have, the hardest one to decarbonize is actually transport. So it, it's very interesting to, to look at any model where you're, you've biogas going into vehicle fleets. And there are large contractor fleets across the country and potentially bio, biomethane, biogas on, by generated through on-farm plants could present an option. We have um, farm machinery uh, or tractor uh, manufacturers now producing biomethane tractors. Um, um, some of them are are gone from concept stage to manufacture stage. So there are certainly opportunities here to, to replace or to offset some fossil energy in our contractor fleet potentially. But just to go back on the electricity and to answer the question from that um, um, attendee, um, it's, it's not, we're not ruling out electricity in terms of farm scale, but 
there is no support scheme at the moment from an electricity perspective, but there is for heat uh, through the SSRH support scheme for renewable heat. The other question which um, the other question which came in there um, was one from Michael, um, and I assume you mean uh, registered uh, gas installers. Do registered gas installers have a role in commissioning the CHP and generation side of the plant, whether lar large or small scale? Um, so, Noel, do you want to take that there? Yeah, we've had a number of uh, RGI members uh, express interest. Uh, two in particular have a. Uh, have already looked at biogas and they're very keen to be involved. There's obviously a number of biogas plants working in the country, so they would have um, obviously had experts in there to, to deal with the gas train. Um, when you're dealing with the gas train, obviously there's a safety issue, so having the right expertise on site for that is obviously important, and uh, having people that know what, what, they're, what they're dealing with. So I think there is a role for them. If, if RGIA, obviously their focus has always been fossil gas, they don't have any experience in dealing with biogas. Um, so if they are to come in on that, it is something that they would need to upskill and, and be able to handle things properly. Okay, if there are any other questions from attendees, uh, feel free to uh, route them through the Q&A tab at the bottom. Uh, Tim, over to you again. Uh, do you want to just um, give us some more insights into your own uh, experience and knowledge on regarding farm scale or small scale biogas? Sure. Um, so I've picked up a couple of pictures here to show that really we're not, you know, we're in, we're reinventing the wheel about 40 years, 40 years, uh, later. Do you want um, to share, share your screen, Tim? I'll share the screen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me see, um, here. So, so here we have, um, a small biogas plant built in, in, um, the South Island of New Zealand, uh, a Wyndham, um, not that far from uh, Dunedin, um, and it gives you the it gives you the basic uh, um, characteristics of this plant. You can see the gas utilisation was running vehicles. Um, basically, this was a, a very standard design that was uh, that was used by the by the Department of Agriculture, and that design enabled. Uh, these digesters to be built by by farmers themselves using local contractors. Um, obviously, those contractors would might be suppliers of steel tanks uh, and um, and various equipment. Um, as I say, the uh, the digesters were very simply heated um, by um, by a very cheap electricity. And this brings me to our um, current project in. Um, with temporary cheese, whereby we we can see that in fact, if uh, we have a we need to heat, if we want to use all the gas for substituting for for um, kerosene use and avail of the and the, the renewable heat um, subsidy for that, then um, heating the digester with a renewable uh, external renewable fuel like wood chip becomes the very definitely the most um, the most uh, economic option. Uh, let me show you a couple of. Uh, you have to just unshare your screen, um, Tim, and just reshare the new slide or the new okay. photograph. So I just okay. Thanks. Go, stop sharing um, and reshare. Yeah. Uh, new share. Okay. So you here just, we have. Um, you'll have to just stop sharing the previous one. Sorry, Tim. Just at the top, uh, up at the top of your screen, you should say stop sharing and. Then reshare the. Oh, stop! Stop, oh, stop share. sharing. Excellent. Stop sharing, okay. and then I just share <laughs> screen again now. To... And then I'll uh, and then I'll share the screen with. Um, let's see. Uh, well, just to just to show you here, I'll just rotate this. Uh, let's see. Rotate. So here's um, as a, the the Department of Agriculture very kindly shared with me their designs. And when I was working for, for farm gas in about 1980, at this point in the mid 80s, um, we embarked on a, on a program to, for publicity really purposes as much as anything, to develop um, our, own, our own biomethane scrubbing facility. And I built, I built it myself um, with using the plans for, for um, provided by the Department of Agriculture this was a very simple water 
uh, water uh, scrubbing system, um, pressure swing system, uh, a bit like a Coca Cola, the way that's uh, the way that's uh, carbon dioxide dissolves in water under pressure. And uh, and I fueled my car for two years um, using using um, the biogas. Uh, it was a dual fuel. It was a dual fuel natural gas system obtained from from Europe, um, and it worked extremely well. Basically, I could switch over to to uh, petrol um, if I ran out of biogas, and vice versa. So, um, so basically, yeah, I think that the there's a lot of interest now in in small scale conversion, and I think that uh, we'll be looking at. Um, we'll be looking at um, definitely various uh, practical small-scale conversion technologies. It's definitely not rocket science, as you as you can see. Um, so I think that uh, this it's a very it's, it's there's huge potential here in Ireland to substitute for uh, for fossil energies um, if uh, if subsidies are removed or changed for for um, farm diesel um, then obviously that price will go up and then there'll be a lot more incentive for farmers to substitute for uh, for fuels but i do okay, think um we're coming close to the end tim um yep. and thanks for sharing those two uh two, two articles so just to conclude maybe from noel do you want to just summarize from your perspective the potential for this scale and size of of biogas in ireland and then i'd ask you tim just to maybe conclude and summarize from your perspective then. So Noel, I'll hand over to you just to give your final thoughts. Yeah, well, I think that just when you see the examples there that Tim has shown up, uh, this is something that was looked at many years ago, some great successes through it. And it's something that it's coming far more to the fore now as we were with, with climate change and everything else and the environmental impacts. And it's interesting that there was a, an environmental focus back then as well. And there's a huge lot of lessons that were learned back then that are very applicable now and there is a huge potential there to, to uh, adapt this into our mainstream agricultural um, uh, practices. So I, I do think the potential is there but also it, it, it's, it's almost gets to the point of being a necessity to uh, take on things like this uh, for, for mainstream agriculture because the impact that, that is going on and that it's, it's having is obviously um, if we're looking at increasing food production we really have to Put a cap on on, on the on the impact it's having um, between water quality and air quality and for the ammonia. So I think these things are, are really relevant and are the things that will enable our agricultural industry to progress into the future. Thanks, Noel. Um, Tim, do you want to just summarise from your perspective the potential you see here from your own experience and also uh, just how you see this project adding to the um, further development of this scale and size of biogas in Ireland? Well, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a very valid, exciting project because of course, um, you know, large scale biogas has its, has its, uh, has its place. Um, and, um, you know, but uh, I think for, for very many farmers, there, there will be the, possibility to use biogas very constructively on their farm as an integrated part of their overall uh, farming operation. So, uh, you know, so the future meaning much more basically sustainable. Uh, we're obviously going to see increasing costs in fuel, in fertilizers, um, and in various other, other inputs into farming. And the digester has a potentially large role to play um, in that. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks to Noel. Thanks to yourself and Noel for, for presenting this morning. Just um, before we conclude, um, I've just added to the chat um, uh, button there, um, if you want to click on it, uh, all our contact information. So just my own email address, if you would like to get in touch uh, directly with us. And then I've also included the, um, the link to our website, which um, will be receiving updates on this project. And also we have a Twitter handle at Farm Biogas, um, where you can also uh, receive updates on the project. We are, as I said, very excited about this project. Um, and I think the significant level of interest that has been shown to date 
uh, signifies the importance of finding solutions at this size and scale. Um, and we look forward to doing that over the next two years uh, as we work through this project. We will be keeping uh, people informed with regular webinars and we will also be hosting an ev further events and, and, um, and demonstration events during the time. So I'd encourage you to follow our website, but also follow our social media channel um, there, uh, the Twitter handle, and we can keep you informed. So we concluded that for this morning. If, as I said, if anyone wants to get in touch with us, feel free to send us an email or get in touch through our website and uh, we'd be happy to assist or to give you further information. So thanks again to Noel and Tim. I'd like to also acknowledge Teresa O'Brien, who is our Airbnb communications manager. And thanks to Teresa behind the scenes uh, for making sure that all of this ran smoothly this morning and um, for um, your uh, ongoing uh, assistance with the organizing of our webinars. So thanks, Teresa, and thanks to you all for attending. Um, we'll conclude on that until the next time. See you soon. Bye.